Well, welcome. Tonight, kind of an interesting show. We're going to talk about speaking and the power of speaking, the confidence that it brings when you can talk in front of a group of people. Um, many of us grew up as nerds, and we always shied away from getting in front of people. Uh, today, I think you're going to learn something about why you want to be able to talk. And they have Toastmasters, they have all sorts of programs for people who want to talk, but we're going to take it down to kids. I mean, helping kids understand what they want to be and, you know, what they want to be when they grow up is a phenomenal uh, exercise. I mean, you got some people like me at 63 who are still trying to figure out what do I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> but why don't we start with an introduction? Thank you, Al. Frankie Andriotti here. Pleasure having me on the show. I appreciate it very much. Look forward to uh, the talk tonight. Tell me about what you're doing. Well, Al, I have a, I come from a, a background of, I went to school for criminal justice. I went to school to be a cop. Didn't work out that way. Didn't work out my plan. So I ended up um, going through different jobs and different retail establishments doing loss prevention. And I ended up getting a job being an HR manager for a company for a while, about 14 years. Um, then I decided I wanted to really venture out and get into sales, get into dealing with people uh, more, uh, different types of jobs like um, payroll sales, HR sales. And uh, recently I do debt collection for a company local in town. And I found within the last probably eight to nine years, I've been speaking to schools, middle schools, high schools, and colleges on trying to get kids to realize it's tough out there and to really work on what they're good at, to find that special sauce, I call it, um, which takes what I call the three Ds and the C, dedication, discipline, determination, with consistency. And I think that's the key today is, is keep working on your successes. Uh, when you reach that goal, when you reach that success, to keep on doing that. So I like to go into schools and really talk about my failures and successes and how it's helped me grow and succeed and talk about my failures, where I went wrong and where I had to check myself and really look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm going to work on Frank. I'm going to work on being the best I can be. So I like to go into schools. I like to talk, say my speech, about anywhere from a half hour to 45 minutes. And um, I have a book that's coming out, Let Me Be Frank With You. Um, it's coming out before Christmas. And um, I really talk about everything about how to excel, how to get better. And I like to also do some career coaching. So my hope is to get into a school, kids hear me, they love me, they want to know more. They want to they wanna find their success. They want to put, put them on a roadmap to success. And that's what I can do for them is help them with my almost 20 years in business, I've seen a lot and done a lot. And I think I can help kids reach their potential and reach, find out what, what, makes them, what makes them move, what makes them drive, what makes them get up and want to uh, tackle something and get a ca great career and love what they do. And I think that's the key today, loving what you do. Well, it sounds like you have an interesting day. I do. <laughs> During the day sounds miserable, collecting bills. It's a, it's a job, but it, again, it's it's a need for it, Al. You know, there's people out there who they don't know how. It's almost like a cable bill. You they don't know how to read an EOB, which is a explanation of benefits. They don't understand the terminology. It's very difficult today. I think um, healthcare needs a reform, and that's a whole different subject. But I think um, it's very um, gifting the job because it makes me feel good that I'm actually helping people clear up their debt. Um, it's a rewarding job for me. I just can't imagine. Hi, Mrs. McGillicuddy. You owe money. <laughs> Pay. It's, it's, it's actually, it's funny. I get people who tell me sometimes that um, you're too nice, Frank. You, you shouldn't be a debt collector. You're too nice. I get that sometimes. But um, what you do is, is you try to help people explain to them why, they, why their collection is in debt. You, you, you explain their debt, and you try to get them to see that, you know, they, it's their debt, they owe it, and you try to get them to pay, and that's the key. And um, I formed a lot of relationships. 
Uh, again, you're talking with attorneys, you're talking with um, insurance companies. So again, you, you become part of it, you know, and you become part of the solution of trying to help people. So far, you're giving me groups of people that I don't look <laughs> forward to talking to. Well, if you talk with Frank, you'll, you'll understand that he's trying to help you. And I think that's the key today is you need to help people. Um, they've come labeled us as, you know, these bad debt collectors wouldn't really, we're just trying to help people and explain what they owe and their debt. Um, but again, it's just, it's, the owner's a great guy, um, great relationship with him and the employees, and it's a great place to work. So um, again, I just, I go to work and try to have a positive attitude every day. I think that's now, the key. I mean, I remember when my daughter, my oldest, hit that inflection point where all of a sudden she had to decide what is she going to be when she grows up. Sure. And she came home and she was really torn because, I mean, she had done relatively well at college. She did have that bad semester junior year where she got a 395. That's where we talk about her <laughs> semester that she got a B plus. I mean, you know, definitely goofed off all semester. <laughs> But she had done well there. She was going to go to law school. She took the LSATs. Uh, her first time out got f like six points off the top. Wow, that's great. Uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Frank Larkin. Judge Larkin was pushing her to go to BC Law. So we were pretty well set. She's going to law school. And then she comes home and says, I don't know what to do. I know if I work hard and I apply myself, I'll do good in law school. At least I think I will. Mm. OK. But I love being with the special needs kids. Hmm. She goes, what do I do? I said, you won't like my answer. She goes, I'm going to tell me to be a lawyer and make money. I said, no, I'm going to tell you I've never worked a day in my life. Hmm. I go to work to have fun. Yeah. You know, that's, if I can't have fun, I don't well, want to go there. She's kind of telling you what she wants to do, right? Yeah, kind of I mean, you knew that, right? the passion she had for the special needs kids yep. was so obvious. But... How many kids are that focused when they're still in school? Sure. Uh, takes a, quite a discipline to do that. But how do you bring that out in somebody? Doesn't. It kind of, you, all you can do is give them the tools, and it's up to them what they do with it. And I think today, even more so, is it, it's got to start at an earlier age, Al. It's got to start earlier with that drive of and trying to figure out. And I know 13, 14 year olds. They don't know what they, they don't know. They don't have any direction. They don't have any idea. They're going through life. They're going through the process. I'm they 63. Go through. I don't have any direction. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure well, out what comes, to do. It comes to a point in your life where you have to, where the rubber meets the road, and you have to make a decision. And I think taking action, if I look back and all my failures, some of them are just if I took action, if I decided to jump, if you do your homework and you do your due diligence and you do your thinking your heart and soul match and you're saying and saying to yourself I want to give this a try give it a try what's the worst thing can happen you fail and you learn from it so next time you come up to bat you don't make the same failures but how do kids know I mean when I was at Holy Cross yeah if you had asked me I'm gonna be a chemist yeah studied chemistry love chemistry I want to be behind the bench doing chemistry and then I got an internship at Waters in the lab Six months later, I was like, oh, my God, I don't want to be behind the bench my whole life. Yeah. Well, I think in different stages of your life, Al, you change, meaning you did something, you did that, you want to move on to something else. And I think that's natural. I think that's part of just being a human being is you always want to do more. You always want to. But I think when you hit your thing, like, I know I want to talk to kids. I know. My purpose is to tell them it's hot out there, explain the stories. Because I think it's good kids hear the failures and successes of people who have done well and who haven't done well. And, and I think it's just a learning, you can always learn something from somebody from what their experience is. And I always had that mentality of someone who's gone through it, done it, there's, there's, some, there's something there. That means they've experienced it. Now, how do you explain to somebody? You say, so-and-so's done well. And I've worked with some great people sure. um, who put their careers first. Yeah. And they made a lot of money. 
<clears throat> they've done very well for themselves. Sure. I, I, I think today's but, notion of the money, Al, that's the thing, the money today, but it's almost was, like you've got to have your own, like, success might mean different for our career than it and does that's Frank what I was getting, Because they hit 50 years old. Sure. Some of them ready to retire. I tried the retirement gig 12 years ago. I was bored out of my mind. Sure. Uh, went back to work. But they hit 50. Yep. Now, they have enough money that they're set. They're ready to settle in with their family. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the kids are gone. Sure. And, then, and the family's not ready to deal with them now. Sure. So to me, working for a bigger company, a pharmaceutical company that... You know, there's been positions over the years. You can make a lot more money, but I wouldn't see my kids. Al, I don't even think, I'll even go back it up even further. I'm not sure school is for everybody. I don't think it is. Um, I think everyone has different talents, uniqueness in what they want to do. I, I'm, the, I'm on the thing, the notion of if it's in your heart and head you want to do something, no matter what it is, you should investigate it. You should look into it. You should try it. Because the worst thing that's going to happen is it's not what you expected it to be. And now mm -hmm. you're back to, you go backwards back to where you were. So the only way you're going to know is by taking action and trying to develop yourself, your success. And by doing that, you have to take chances. You have to take educational risks, I call it. And the more that you do that, even me going to be 45, I, I see as, like I, I was talking to you about taking in quarter chunks, like a football game, quarter one, you're learning, you're trying to learn out what you want to do. Quarter two, now you, now you get into what you're doing and you're becoming successful at it. You're making contacts, you're doing well. Quarter three, now you're successful. Now you're prospering. And now quarter four is you're planning your exit strategy. So I think all of that is in a, like a Rubik's Cube of life, of trying to figure out what is it that I want to do. And whatever it is, I want to go do it. And I think if it's education, if it's, again, a lot of trade schools, BVT, Milford, I can see the change in their programs. They're, they're moving educational around. So, again, I think it's all great and good. It's all up to the individual and the student, I believe, on what they want to become. And, they, and it's hard. You really don't know. They don't have a roadmap to that. And that's what Frank can provide is helping you discover your roadmap. It'll come out. My questions that I ask when, I, when you see my book, the questions I have in each chapter to talk about how to develop yourself, things to find, like a mentor. I talk about mentorship. I think it's so healthy to find people who are in the space doing the job you might want to do, to investigate, to learn from them, to ask questions. That's the stuff that's the special sauce. You know, the special, you're going to find that one person that really cares about you. And I think that's one of the notions today, Al, is I think today, be people become selfish. They want, like you were talking about, I want the money, I want the prestige, I want the job. Instead of thinking about the value of kids today and the value of where, what that generation, you know, you talk about leaving things to next generations. And I think what I want to do is leave a notion of you can do it. Anyone can do it with hard work, dedication, discipline. Anyone can do it. You just have to put the hard work and the effort in. Oh. When I've been asked of all the kids that I end up tutoring or mentoring, when they say they want a clean answer, what should I do? And you try and explain to them that everybody's goal, everybody's life is going to be different. Sure. You cannot sure. be Al Korea. I can't be Frank Andriotti. Right. No matter how much I try, right. There's I'm only not going to be Frank. Right. Um, and the only thing I've ever come up with absolutely a common uh, course is follow your passion. Very true. And, you know, you sit there and say, if you love what you're doing, somehow it always works out. Eh, you talk about it, you'll never work a day in your life. If you, if that's your, if that's your, if you, when you find that and when it hits you, you know. I can't describe it. It's a feeling that's um, <clears throat> just... You know, get, it should make you emotional. It should make you jump. It should make you have butterflies. It should make you think about what value do I want to give back to. And, and you know, it always <clears throat> pays you back because, you know, when I think yeah. about it, I'm working with people that I started working with back 
God almighty, 89. Wow. Young engineer yep. who was doing very well, but thought maybe he wants to get into business. And I had a little bit of input into that. Um, a year ago or so, he called me and said, you've been helping me all along. Why don't you come join us for full time? Wow. It's different. Okay, let's see. I went, met the people in the company, and I was really, really pleased with their values, their ethics. And, I mean, I do have flaws in my character that I know. I cannot work with people who are not ethical. Sure. No matter how much money, yeah. no matter what. Those are your boundaries. Those th are your there boundaries. are boundaries. Right. And the people that I want to work with, I want to feel good about working with them. Sure. You know, because when they go out there and meet people, they're representing me. Absolutely. You know, and you run into the people that, I tried explaining it to a college student, where I said, if you really feel like you need to take a shower after you've talked to somebody, <laughs> yeah, if you just know. You know. You, I don't care how much money they give you. It's right. not worth it. Exactly. Yeah. No, I talk about that in my, in my book, and I talk about that with students, is your name is everything today. It, it, it should represent everything that you do, and it goes with you everywhere. And I try to explain to kids that that's the foundation. The foundation is you set that. You set those parameters of what you want, what, what you want to accept in life and what you don't accept in life. And you are the one that has to hold that. You're the one that holds that line. You're the one that holds. You're the only one that can do that. And I, I think, again, Al, the, the, the notion of you got to do the work. you got to put in the time. you got to put in the effort. And I think today maybe kids don't put in that effort. That they, you know, they don't have that person that they can, oh, yeah, mom and, my mom and dad tell me that, or, yeah, I've heard that before. I get into the nooks and crannies of if you follow certain things, certain rules, certain ways, it will help you. So you mentioned your name. <laughs> I mean, I grew up in the worst sin, whether you're an old Italian, an old Portuguese, what was to embarrass the family. Mm. You know what I mean? Well, fear. We had fear then. Today's fear is kind of different. Is there's really not a lot of fear. There's too much distractions. I talk about that in my book. I talk about there's too much social webs, you know, Instagram, Snapchat. Sure, some of it good, yeah, but it's the intention of using it for certain purposes. And I talk about that in my book. I talk about networking the old-fashioned way like we're doing tonight, face-to-face. -face. Talking? <laughs> talking, yeah. Texting, emailing. Out of all of it, I love the face-to-face -face because, again, that's where you can't read someone's caption in the text. You can't read, you might misinterpret whatever they're writing into your own way. So the face-to-face -face will always be best. And I, I talk about that in my book. I talk about that when I talk to, my, to the students. I talk about being real, getting that face-to-face -face interaction. You know, it's funny because when you say being real, one of the hardest things that I've found is trying to explain to young students, <clears throat> young people, millennials, sure. Hard to say they're young, I'll show you how old we are. <laughs> but to them, it's perfectly acceptable talking to you, going Yeah. And you try and explain them saying, maybe someday the paradigm will shift, but you're still dealing with old fogies like me that yep. find that incredibly rude. Sure. <clears throat> and if you're going to do that in front of me, I'm probably not going to want to deal with you. Sure. So to me, that's, you know, a career-limiting move. You know, and to teach somebody that you're always selling something, yourself, mm -hmm. your ideas, and if you turn me off, well, I'm not listening anymore. True, very true. And I find it, I, I think when I go speak, Al, and I talk about this, I, stay, I say it more in a stern way so that they, don't, they know that I'm not kidding. I'm meaning that this is really... You're going to go for a job interview, and if you're playing on your phone, you're not getting that job. Right. If someone's talking you face-to-face, -face and you're on your phone looking at your Snapchat, Instagram, you're not getting the job. I'm telling you right now from an HR standpoint. Um, and I think kids need to hear the real messages in the real, the real world because they're not living in the real world. The real world is you go to work every day, you work hard, 
you make a, a wage and you, per, and you have expenses. You have things that are in life that come up that, again, you can't just run to mom and dad and say, mom, dad, here you go, pay for it. You, you know? can't? No, not Would in the real world. Would you talk to my daughters? <laughs> uh, I'm sure your daughters are doing great. They have a good example to lead. So, again, I, I, I think, Al, a lot of it is just they need to hear these messages. They need to hear, um, when you're talking about old school versus new school, I think some of the old school ways of, again, that just that interaction, that face-to-face -face is so important today. And especially if you're going to be in any type of speaking or any type of job, Sales. you need to do that. Sales, you need to have that face-to-face -face interaction, be able to speak to people, be able to look somebody in the eye, be able to tell them how you feel. And again, I think it's all important. So again, the phone thing is definitely, to me, it's one of the like, great invention, but I'm not sure it's, um, I think it's overutilized. Well, I think it's been hard to tell these kids that it's called a telephone. Right. It does other things except data. Exactly. You know, and one, one young lady from the school, I said, see that button? That lets you talk to human beings. Yep. Is yours rusted shut? You know, if it isn't, yep. you should be using that button. Yep. You know, but they can text six people at a time, and yep. they just find that it's what they grew up with. Yeah, it's, again, I think a lot of it, and, and I talk about that in my book, is talking about my first chapter in my book is about family. It's about my grandparents, and I learned so much. I was, I was blessed. I had three, three sets of grandparents that really loved me. I lived with each and, one, each and every one of them, and it was just a When I look back as well, the teachings that they gave me, and I remember it all like yesterday. You know, they kept repeating over and over the same thing, same thing. Even my mom today talked about reading and writing and reading and writing till eventually now I'm an author and I'm writing books. It's funny, like you're looking like, Mom, I'm not going to read. You know, when you're a kid and you have summer reading and you're like, Mom, I don't want to read that. I want to go out and play. My mom made me read. But, you know, when you were a kid, you knew the answers. I got it thrown in my face, well, what was middle school East, uh, by my old French teacher, Anne Marie Longo. What a trip she was. <laughs> and I gave her such a hard time. This is when, you know, I'm high school, eighth grade, high school. And I finally looked at her and I said, Miss Longo, I don't know why I'm studying French. I will never use French. I will I never the same speak thing. French. Yep. This is really a waste of good oxygen. And to her credit, she took it. And then 24 years later, when I came back to Milford, somehow that woman remembered that comment because she came to me and said, I'm just curious. Do you remember when you said, and I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> she was, just out of curiosity, where have you been living for the last four years? I said, Paris. That's funny. Did you speak any French in Paris? And I was like, oh, my God. Talk about funny. putting perspective on it. You know, at that point, I knew everything, yep. right? I knew Spanish, Portuguese, English. I wouldn't need anything else. And funny. where do I end up living? Paris. France. That's funny. You know, so a lot of it is just, you know, the, the nature of being yep. a teenager. Yeah, and I think everyone's is different in a way. You know, they... Um, today's sports, you know, everyone's got to be in sports. Well, there's other things you can do too, other activities, there's Boy Scouts, there's all kinds of activities, youth organizations that you can be a part of and, again, get enjoyment from. And I think th what I look at in my life, Al, is I kept busy, I kept active. And I think that's the key today is staying active in so many things so you get a broad range of experience. And I think it's healthy to do. I think it's healthy to be part of different clubs, organizations, sports. I think it all helps you build your person. Well, I think, you know, I think back. I was one of those introverted nerds. You, you didn't want to get in front of anybody or speak to anybody. It was scary. Sure. Because it was that failure element that I could go out and try and talk to you and you would start laughing or say, no, that's just stupid. Sure. I can't imagine something more important that I wish I had learned was how to convey my message. 
Sure. When I At was age. young. Sure. I mean, I had to wait till I left the lab at Waters, went into sales, to start learning how to make a pitch, which was sure. how to convey my message in a way that other people would accept it. Yep. Boy, wouldn't I have loved to know that in high school. And that's my message, is trying to extract that and show kids that, again, just think of something that you like to do in life, something that you're good at, something that makes you jump, makes you excited. Maybe you should do a little investigating into what that is. And maybe read Frank's book, do the exercises, and I think that's going to help you get you on your way to starting your career and your path and what you want to do. And I think that's the important part is it's all about you. It's about where you want to go, what you want to do. And again, parents, family, life, there's so many things getting thrown at you at you know, middle school age, high school age. You're just trying to do fact finding. You're trying to find out what is it that I want to do. And I think, again, life's going to throw curveballs. Life's going to throw potholes, well, I mean, detours. I grew up here in Milford. And like most Milford kids, the first thing I want to do is run away. So, you know, sure. I take my first steps by going all the way to Worcester to school. Sure. So I can still come home on weekends, but I'm off on my own. And then I was fortunate. I, mean, I loved Washington, D.C. My darling bride and I yeah. lived on a boat four days a week at the Maryland Yacht Club, uh, lived in the house three days a week, then moved to Paris, spent four years, waters paying for everything, running around the Middle East, Africa, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Sounds exciting. Yeah, it was, it was yeah, great. Sure. Yeah. But then the gravitational pull of this town, but the center of the universe, when I had a daughter, somehow it starts really hitting you that what was important is her having the opportunities sure. to experience what I did. Yeah. Now, it got a little freaky when like, we went to Milford High, and my old biology teacher is now her biology teacher. <laughs> That's, funny. That's a Milford thing, but you know. Sure. But you know, you start looking, saying all of a sudden, as much as I mean, Washington was a great place to live. Paris sure. was fun. But when it came down to instilling the core values, none of those towns compared to what they learned sure. here in Milford. Sure. But we had one that was totally an extrovert, and one that. Grew into it being an extrovert. <laughs> yep. And it was, you know, again, it was all about making them feel comfortable that as a kid, it's okay to fail. Absolutely. You know, you're not, I don't know of any kids that have never failed. Yeah, it's almost, uh, again, no one's perfect. I talk about that too. Perfection, you aim for perfection, but there's always something to learn. There's always something to do new. There's always something to conquer. Well, I was asked a question. I said, you know, if you've never failed, you failed at life. It's true. Because the only way you never fail is you never put yourself out there. That's right. And it's true. And it's, again, that's the reason why I'm here today is putting myself out there. I'm trying to show that it can be done. It can be, anything's possible with hard work and dedication. You know, and I, I think, again, I think the kids need to hear that. They need to hear those failures and the successes and how you overcome and adapt to those changes. And again, I think they need to apply that. They need to learn from other people's stories, from other people's, I think you can learn a lot from somebody hearing their failures and successes. So when you come across to something like that, oh, geez, I heard that, I heard that in my school last year. This. This Mr. Mr. Andriotti came in and he started talking about this. I remember that. And that's kind of like the, what I want to give is the notion that it's possible. It's possible to achieve. Anything and is possible. The question is how hard do you, you want to, you want a Rolls Royce? Right. You can own a Rolls. You may have to live in it because <laughs> right. you can't afford a house right. at the same time. Right. But if the most important thing to you is to have a Rolls, I'm sure you can figure it out. I'm sure you can figure it out. And then I always get a kick out of the people who want to tell you what you can't do. I love those. That's, that's, that should fuel you. If it doesn't fuel you to, and 
you know how sometimes I, I, I get this all the time. I get it from other people from, I laugh because who's the, anyone to put a label on anything? You know, again, to, to be able to tell somebody that they can't do something is just plain ignorance in my, in my book because anything is possible with, with your mindset and the help and your work ethic and anything, you can achieve anything. And I'm living proof. I didn't think I could write a book. It took me eight years to write a book. And now it's finally coming out. And there's no dates on the book. There's no dates on degrees. There's no dates on... You should feel proud that you hit but a goal. It really annoys me when people try and project their limitations... Exactly. ...on our kids. Exactly. Because I'm sitting there in different functions and meetings in Milford, mm -hmm. and I listen to the problem with the bad kids. And right away, I mean, you know, the antenna goes up, mm -hmm. the nerves, bad kids? Well, you know, those kids that come from areas of Milford where they don't speak English and they don't do this and they... Right. And I'm sitting there saying, boy, that's horrible. I'm really glad nobody ever told me that me and all the kids from the Heights were part of the bad kids. <laughs> and Labeling. that when we yep. came out, I mean, I never... My wife, my darling bride, was the one that pointed out to me when she said, don't you ever speak to your parents in English? And of course, I went, of course. No, not unless there's somebody in the house, you know, you got a guest who doesn't speak Portuguese. Sure. But I came out, only knew Portuguese, and all of a sudden met all these kids. And I said, what the heck are they saying? Boy, are these kids <laughs> dumb. They can't speak. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm the one. Yeah. They are all speaking a common language. I'm the one that doesn't understand it. Sure. But That's then all of a sudden, you realize, okay, it's a bump in the road. That's all it is. I'll learn English, and yep. off I go. Yep. You know, and you try and explain, you know, to my daughters, when they hear about this glass ceiling, I'm sorry. Don't let any man ever limit you. Because then you're limiting yourself. Exactly. You may have to work harder. You may have to work smarter. But if they get in your way, run them over because they're the ones ah, that's that are limiting. You're going to have that attitude of you're gonna, whatever you set in your mind you're going to do, you're going to do it. And you've got you to keep yourself to it. You have to keep succeeding. You've got to keep achieving. You've got to keep the dream alive, whatever your dream is. And I think that's the important part is even when you get to your dream, you know, when you get to your dream and you've succeeded, there's something else you want to do. There's something else that comes. It's part of life. Something else that comes new into your life. You know, there's something new that you want to conquer or something new that you want to look into. Or something that you just feel like, yeah. When I was 20 years old, somebody gave me a chance at a little, back then a little company called Waters. And I learned how to sell. Hmm. And there were so many people telling me that at my age, I could not be successful. Mm -hmm. You're 21 years old. Everybody around you is 10 to 20 years older than you. Mm -hmm. You'll never be successful. And I bet you look at bet that now and you're like, you kind of feel sad. You feel sad that they had that opinion of you. I do for them. Yeah, for them. But I want right. to go back and say. Because why, why didn't they see what you saw? You ignorant, well, right. you limited view of a person. Sure. Maybe you actually did help me. And I got lucky and broke every record in sales they had sure. because you picked a, a fight. Right. Yeah, you I mean, threw that, down the gauntlet. Exactly. And God dang, if I'm not going to pick it up. It fueled you to yeah. succeed. It fueled you to. So, you know, it's hard to explain to kids that sometimes when you run into these obstacles. And you're going to run into them. Believe you know, me, you're going to run into them. But, you know, I had 16 daughters on the soccer team. And the life lessons you try and teach them is simple. Yep. If you want it bad enough, you'll go get it. You'll go get it. Like yes, that. you may have to practice longer because you don't have the natural skill. Or, or, or. But at the end of the day. Yep. There's no excuses. No. You know, there's no excuses. And I think that's the other thing I talk about with kids is throw away the excuses. Because, again, I've been there, done that. You can't, to get to success, you can't have excuses. It's just they don't go together. And I think too many times, I mean, I was at Woodland when I was the president of the Parent Teachers mm -hmm. um, Council. 
And there was a fourth grader, so it would make him 10, who flipped off a teacher. Wow. If I wasn't in the office by accident, the principal's office going over some stuff, I wouldn't have believed it when I, the parent came walking in, looked at the boy's teacher and said, what did you do to antagonize my son? <laughs> I was stunned. Yeah, it's... I mean, my father never laid a hand on me. But I'm sure old, you know, old daddy Andriotti is the same yeah. as my father. If somebody ever called and said, Whew. Frankie flipped the bird <laughs> to the teacher and told him to... Um, um, you wouldn't want to go home, put it no, that way. That would be it. Do what stay you, away. God, do what you want to me in uh, school. It, like you said, a different era, a different... Um, but I it, had fear. I guess, I guess the thing now, like, you know, okay, I've been 25 years out of high school. I went to Framingham High School. I've been 25 years out, and it's so much a bit... I can see the difference. I can see, just in 25 years, how such of a difference schools are today. And... I'm not sure going forward where we're going to go, meaning there's always, there's always changing coming. There's change coming all the time, and you have to be able to adapt to it. You have to be able to, and I'm going through it now. I have a, gonna be, he's 15 years old. He's going to be, he's a freshman at Milford High, and I see so much of him and me, of me and him, and it's, I, I'm on him. Tyler, did you do your homework? Yeah. You, you know, let me see your homework, you know. And he's starting, to, you know, it's, it's the discovery period. You know, he's trying to see how much he can get away with, what he can't get away with. But I, I, f I find it, Al, is I find it's like me going through high school all over again with him. And that's what I was going to say. When you say you don't know where it's going, I do. Yeah. It's going to make a big circle because all of a sudden I'm doing everything my father taught me. Exactly. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't be like my dad. And I'll never be like him. Dang. Yeah. I am like him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or when I look at my daughters sure. and I see how much of my darling bride is in both of them. Yeah. And you have to laugh. You do it because you're like, you never expected to come full circle. No. You don't expect to be like your father or your, or your parents. You don't expect that. But Al, I think a lot of it, in, especially in Milford, it's so family oriented. I mean... There's so many, everyone knows everybody. And that's why I love living in Milford. It's just everyone knows everybody. It seems like I have cousins all over the place or I have family all over the place because, you know, people that I see, they're really not acquaintances. They're really friends. They're really people that I know. But w what's the definition of a Milfordian? Born, third, born raised, I mean, third generation, generation. Milford, and you live within two miles of your mother. Exactly. It's <laughs> I mean, true. You got to have both of them. Yeah. They come from the plains, so I've been there pretty much all my life. Except yeah, for my high school years. The Plains was always a big rival of the Heights. Yeah. God dang Italians, get back to your side of town. But the great join, joiner, if you want to call it, the great unifying factor was the hill on Water Street. Yeah. So on Wednesday nights, when we grew up, you went down on a Wednesday night to listen to the band concert in Hopedale Park. Yeah. Or you went to listen to Aerosmith on Friday night. Now, the kids from the Plains, Luby Ave, Heights, who are always at each other. Sure. The minute you went over, you turn that hat around, and now, wait a minute. If some kid from another town is picking on kids from the Plains. All of a sudden, you're one. They're my cousins. Right. Right? They're yep. my family. Yeah. So all of a sudden, we all bleed red. We're Milford. Yeah. And we'd have discussions, but when the discussions came... I never worried about the kids from Luby Ave not having my back. Right. Now, as soon as we came back over the hill, it's, goddamn, get back to the back planes. To, yeah. <laughs> it goes back to normalcy. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it was kind of, you know, I think of it as cousins. Yeah. And that's what, to me, I went to an event this weekend, and Milford's gone through some turmoil over different events. But this was the annual Formasa, Friends of the Milford Special Olympics. Okay. I didn't see that on Facebook, but it looked like they had a really oh, good time. It, was, it wasn't even the fun we had. It was seeing their faces. all the Milfordians I know. Uh, how many were there sure. to support our kids? That's great. Uh, yeah. that's what, you know, that's I what remember you like looking see. at a couple people saying, you know, this is Milford. When Band together. We're all together. We yeah. may disagree, 
totally in politics. But that's okay. But it comes to taking care of Milford kids. You know, you're back to flipping the hat around and yeah. everybody's won. It's true. So now, how do you get into the schools? It's a good question. I've been, you know, again, I, I need to get into the superintendent's office. I need to speak to, uh, again, I'm trying to get into, just starting with the Metro West schools, just trying to start locally. And um, hopefully when my book comes out, I'm able to give that to them with a one-pager, a little bit about Frank. And, again, try to see how I can penetrate and get into these schools to really tell them, to help them find themselves, help them find that gift of the, you know, what's inside them. And I think if they start the process now, especially middle schools, high schools, definitely. College is more, my talk is more on colleges about, okay, you're in college, you're in the career, you're in a major, where are you going with it? Uh, what, what career paths have you started to look at? Um, what have you done? Have you come up with a job description? Have you seen a job description? Have you seen a, a resume, a cover letter? Have you put one together? Um, so again, I think all healthy things to, to look at especially from the middle school to the college arena. Well, even the college, I mean, I'm amazed at how many kids follow along. I want to be a doctor. No, at Holy Cross especially. Sure. Very um, big school for getting people into med school. Yep. Sure. But being a good doctor school. isn't the same. You know, when we grew up, well, there were four doctors in Milford. <laughs> so you, everybody that's Milfordian could right. trace them, Dr. Cicchetti, Dr. Mastriani. You know, you go through it. There's yep. only four of them. Sure. One of them brought you into Milford. Yep. Um, now, you got hospitalists. It's different. It's different. The Specialized. The people who were general practitioners made a very good living. They still make a good living. Sure. But when I think about what they go through, I mean... If, you spe if you're a specialist, you're almost retired by the time you come out of school. Sure. You know, I'm joking, but being facetious on the fact that you're still young, but you know, I came out of school at 22, something like that. Sure. They're coming out at almost 30. Right. Oh, my God. They're eight years behind the curve in revenue. Right. They need to make it. They need to make that money. Right. So you, know, you talk to people, to these kids, and you say, do you have a passion for medicine? And some kids love being with people, helping people. Sure. It's a great profession for them, regardless of the salary. Absolutely. You know, for yep. a year and a half, I begged my daughter, rethink your strategy, because yeah. I didn't see the passion. Yeah. I said, you can be in biotech. You can be in a lot of different careers and make as much or a very solid living doing something you love. Sure, absolutely. This idea that I got to be a doctor or a lawyer. Definitely. Why? Yeah, it's like I said. It's up to you. It's up to what your outlook is. What do you want to do? And again, I think I think it's healthy to even change your mind. You might see something and you want to change your mind. Again, it's healthy to do. It's I almost say it's if you're not doing that, if you're not rethinking, if you're not strategizing, you need to start doing well, it. And you need to you need to start today because. One thing I know we don't get enough uh, more of is time. Yes. And that's the element. Can't buy about. time. Can't buy time. And, you know, I think about it because freshman year at Holy Cross, I'm going to be a chemist. I'm going to be behind the bench. That's what, yeah. when I went as an intern at Waters, and the company was fantastic to me, um, I realized I don't want to be behind the bench. Yeah. I love chemistry. Right. So you changed. So I changed, yeah. and I went into the sales and then marketing, and yeah. my whole life I've been doing that because I really loved doing it. You know, and th there's benefits. I mean, as a kid from Milford, I never thought I'd be having dinner at the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates, mm -hmm. or when Sharon wanted to go shopping to go down to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. You know, just for kicks, we decided yeah. we want to go see the Gates of Babylon. I've read about them. I've never seen them. Yeah. So we were at the Baghdad Fair, and we said, why not? Let's go. We got a couple days off. That is what I remember. Sure. I forget the plane landing and <laughs> the mortars going off around the plane. 
I forget how many hours you know that you end up working when you're going straight through 20 hours. Sure. That becomes an ends to a means. Right. And that's when you know that, okay, so I got stuck. And no, I didn't like being at the Iraqi embassy, getting bored and leaving when they blew it up. By 45 minutes, me getting uh -huh. bored, I was there. Or when they blew up the um, Hava Halari flight, uh, Turkish Airlines flight, and Charles de Gaulle Wasi. Wow. My wife and I were scheduled. She got sick that morning. We canceled our flight. Hmm. That plane, that people wow. uh, getting on the plane got firebombed. Wow. So if I wanted to dwell on those little problems, sure, it could scare the heck out of me. It might not do anything. But remembering the great times we had. That's the key. You That's know, a kid key. from Milford. You know, you sit there and say, a poor kid from Milford getting to fly around the world, getting to see things that we never, I mean, imagined. you read about. Right. You never imagined you'd do it. I never dreamed I'd right. go there. Absolutely. You know, I mean, getting stuck in Beirut, not fun. Sure. But, okay, it's part of the gig. But it's, again, talking to kids, saying, what is it you like? Like when they're picking their schools. You know the funny thing, Alice, is they're going to tell you. Yeah. They're going to tell you. Some, they, they're going to they're gonna spend so much time, I don't know what I want to do. I don't, they know. It comes out. Well, Eventually like, it comes out. Ask a fundamental question. Do you like being in a big school? My darling bride loved Penn State. Good school? Yeah. Good school. It would be agony for me mm -hmm. to go to a school where my classes are 300 kids. Yeah. You got to be kidding me. I mean, my of... junior and senior year, I had six and eight kids in each class. Yeah. I had a couple classes of three and four kids. Total opposite. It's a small campus. There's only 2,800. Right. It was close enough to Milford that if I wanted to get home, in half hour I could be here. Yeah. That, and when I start talking to kids, saying, wait a minute, what do you like the most? Do you want to be, be you, great school? Yeah. I couldn't imagine a school I'd detest more to live. Doesn't have a campus. I think that's one of the things, I like. I think they, kids become too indecisive. They don't know where to go towards. And I think the more you're indecisive and not taking that leap of faith, it, it's going to come. It's, it, again, what school you want to go to, what you want to become, what do you want to do, it's in you. And that's, I try and tell kids, follow your heart. When I got true. the Holy Cross... Something there said, yep, mm -hmm. I can't tell you why, but it felt right. Sure. You know, now, BU, I admire, it's a great school. Sure. But to me, it's got no campus. It's in the middle of the city. Yeah. Ugh, I couldn't stand it. Now, right. friends of mine. Love it. Northeastern, <laughs> BU, they love it. Yeah. The city life. The... They, they can go a yeah. hundred different places any Friday night. So you sit there and say, guess what? Holy Cross would be the wrong school for you. I went both ways. Uh, I went to Dean College and I commuted. It was Dean Junior at the time, back in uh, 1993. In 72, <laughs> no, 73, we went to Dean College because we ran out of chemistry and biology course at Milford High. Yeah. So Uncle Paul Raftery sent us to Dean Junior three days a week. So I got my associates there in criminal justice, and then I decided I wanted to go to a small school, but Westfield State University, which is now Westfield University, and I got my bachelor's in criminal justice, but I actually lived there. So I had two spectrums. I had like, the commuter, which I come and go, and then the actual living there. And I got two different, two different outlooks on college life and college. And Man, if I could go back and do it again, that's the thing, Al, is everyone sometimes has regrets and things that they haven't done. And when you look back on things, if I did this, if I did that. But you're on a path on it for a reason. You know, I think everyone has a destiny. Everyone has something of value, something of they're great with. Something they're just... But see, that's my... You know, if you'd say, what's your biggest failure? Hmm. My biggest failure is I don't have any regrets. Nothing substantial. Sure. And that's you know, great. Would great. I have gone to that game when it turned out to rain and snow? No. But that doesn't count. Right. I wouldn't change anything. That's great, you know. Because I've just had fun all along the way. And that's the key. 
That's the key. If your love, if your heart's in it, your head's in it, your soul's in it, and it's part of you, you're gonna. It, it's again. It's not gonna feel like work. It's not gonna feel like a job. It's not gonna. It's just gonna be natural. Until someone experiences that natural feeling, they're gonna be. Like, oh, this is what it. This is what it feels like. I remember one of the things that made me the happiest was when my mother said her dream that she never thought would happen came true because she had her family back in Milford. Mm. Now, mom came in 49. Okay. So, you know, she passed away last year at 94. Sorry. Except for the year and a half she lived with us in Washington, she lived in Milford since she was 16 years old. Wow. So, you know, you turn around saying there's... 78 so years that she banged in here, or 74 years. And you sit there and say, wow, being able to do that, you know, for the first time I felt like I paid back my mother <laughs> for everything she put up with. with me. My, uh, my grandfather was a hat maker. He worked for Cartagena's, and he actually ended up having his own company called Frank Rico Hat Corporation. And it's funny, as I was a... Uh, you know, getting into my adolescent years, 20 years old, and so going through college, I'm like, wow, it would be cool to own a hat factory, hat, hat company. And my grandfather, he has a vision of, it's not going to work, Frank. Hats are on the way out. out. That, hats are not in today. And my grandfather was able to, again, give me those little insights. All my grandparents, so my grandmothers and my grandfathers, I mean, I was blessed. I was just lucky to have uh, six great people that... Uh, really loved me. And that's, again, I think even in, like mentors, I could write a book, probably my next book might be on mentors, on so many people that um, have helped me become successful and hit my goals, hit my successes. And you hear this message all the time, Al, of everyone thinks uh, they can be self-made. I don't think self-made is a, um, I, I, I think no matter what success you get to, you had help along the way. Well, it's the same thing as when people say spontaneity. Right. And I always laugh when you say self-made. Well, spontaneity, Portuguese definition is many well-rehearsed alternatives. Yep. You know, so if you've got people helping you all along the way, yep. no matter what you face. Yeah. yeah it's... You know, I, I knew that no matter what happened, when I went home, mom and dad were there and they would support me. That's the... Have no god dang idea what to do. You know, whenever there was an event at school, my father would put on his coat, put on his little hat, and show up at school. Okay. And he'd be sitting there in the audience, and I know he had no idea what was going on. His English wasn't that good. But he knew. Somebody had told him, you need to go to support your son. Sure. Now, the lesson he taught me is invaluable. Absolutely. My mother and father were there. Even more impressive is that they didn't know what was going on. They just knew they were supposed to be there if they wanted to help their son. They loved you. That's the key. Now, I mean, my youngest daughter once told me how she was traumatized in her youth because she can remember <laughs> the dance and the field trip I missed. I said, now, wait a minute. In nine <laughs> years, I missed one dance. And one field trip. She said, see, trauma. <laughs> it's funny, huh? How yeah. kids remember the darndest things, too. Yeah. yeah, I'm sitting there saying, in nine years, I missed one field trip. Yeah. One. Wow. But she remembers. She remembers. That's great, though. Would I have traded it? Not yeah. for all the money in the world. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing, is that when you talk about getting married, having a kid, having children... You know, your focus is not about you anymore. It's more about them and more about what they want to do. And I think, again, I think today, again, I call it the selfishness. You know, there's a lot of selfish people out there. Is try to become one of those that you're not selfish. Try to give back. Try to show the value into, and mine's kids. You know, I, I think if I can help one, it's, I did my job. I did what I set out to do is to help people to, Get to well, this. Somebody asked, why do you volunteer? Why do you do this with all these kids? Why do I said, I'm just paying back an old debt. That's it. That's what you want to do. I'm not taking credit for anything. Yeah. You know, um, when, when daughters turned six, I started coaching them in soccer. 
continued to high school. It's so easy to say I'm doing it for them. Yeah. Yeah, well, that would be the biggest. <laughs> it's well for you. It's when more about making you feel on how I'm you. I'm together with my daughters four nights a week. Good for you. That's Two great practices, job. one game, and then the team. We were, our team was together since they were six. So we'd wow. go out either a Friday or a Saturday night, depending on our schedule. We'd go the other night to a movie, oh, nice. to Papa Gino's or somewhere. Yeah. And the whole team went. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. How much is that worth? Well, they look back and they talk about it. That's when you know. Yeah. You know? I know. I mean, I know we're friends. You know, when they turned 15, we put the boyfriends in the team and we had a <laughs> co-ed team. Wow. You know, so again, yeah. we were always together. Yep. Can I say that was for them? Yeah, I can pretend. I mean, I was blessed that yeah. I had my daughters four nights a week. You know, the team went on a vacation to Disneyland all together, 29 people. <laughs> the following year, we, half of us went on um, a cruise in the Caribbean. Oh. See, those are the things that you remember, though. Those are the things that when you do together, you, you remember those the good times. You remember what you did. You remember how good it made them feel, too. And I think that's the key to that was the love, the happiness, the enjoyment. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing is I see my oldest. Now I have two wonderful grandchildren. Oh, that's a four-year-old boy wow. and a 10-month-old girl. And I see her doing things for him that I used to do for her. She doesn't have to say anything. Yep. But you couldn't give me a more pleasurable experience sure. than to say maybe I didn't do everything wrong. Yep. You know, Maybe there was some good that... She maybe they, maybe they were listening. Yeah. Scary movie. <laughs> so, as we come to the end, somebody asks, why should I listen to Frank? What would you say? Frank doesn't, Frank doesn't cook, cookie cut anything. He gives it to you real. He gives you the real life, the honest truth. And again, I'm trying to help kids benefit themselves to succeed. And I think that's the key today is helping others get to their success and finding your success. And it takes, it takes a little thought, hard a lot work, of work, and a lot of work. And it's a continuous thing through life. It's not just you stop, you keep going, and well, you keep achieving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Al. Appreciate it. To our it. six loyal viewers, <laughs> I hope that you understand the more you do for the kids, it pays you back. When you get to my age and your daughters keep taking care of you, you can't ask for better than that. And if they still want to be around an old man, I am in heaven. So as always, thank you for joining. To our six loyal viewers, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better night than tonight. Good night, all. Good night, all. I've been home, been running all my life just.